Hello, my name is Mornay Mossad. I'm the director of the Institute for Futures Research here at We Read For You, where I'm reviewing the book Exponential Organizations by Salim Ishmael. Why new organizations are 10 times better, faster, and cheaper than yours, and what to do about it. So I'll take you through a journey, my uh, sense of the book, a review of the book, and also a little bit of an analysis of the book in terms of how it might be useful for large organizations. Please do join us. What's important about the author, uh, Salim Ishmael, is that he is one of the founders of Singularity University. And the founders of Singularity University have this idea that they give to their students. Um, and they ask them this question, how will you positively impact one billion people in the next decade? In a certain sense, that's what this book is about. It's about building an exponential organization, something that grows at a staggering rate and affects enormous numbers of people. So it's really all about building these absolutely massive organizations very, very quickly, but in a different way. And I think that's where the book has something very interesting to offer. And they speak about this idea of combating the organizational immune system because their argument is that if you're going to try and build something new and innovative, but you're going to do it in a bureaucratic organization, you're on a hiding to nothing. You've got virtually no chance. Well, let's start with the definition. They say an exponential organization is one whose impact or output is disproportionately large, at least 10 times larger compared to its peers because of the use of new organizational techniques that leverage exponential technologies. So they say that 20 years ago, it took 20 years to become a billion dollar company. And now for many organizations, it takes less than nine months. My business is taking a bit longer, I must just tell you. <laughs> the average half-life of a business competency, this is interesting for business schools, the average half-life of business competency has dropped from 30 years in 1984 to five years today. So if you graduate today and you've got some skills, would be nice, then within five years, at least half of what you've learned is gone, or you could argue, depending on how you define it, you've only got a few years to go and that will expire. Whereas in 1984, you had 30 years to get halfway. 89% of Fortune 500 companies from 1955 are not on the list in 2014. In the next 10 years, 40% of the Standard & Poor 500 companies will be gone. So, do you say, well, you know, these new things, all these kids with their technology, you know, I don't know, these things. Or do you say, hang on, there's some real money here. So they give you an awful lot of examples of valuation increases of organizations. So, you know, a few examples there, you might recognize some of them uh, here in South Africa, Airbnb or Google or Uber or... Uh, Snapchat or so on. Uh, so there they give you the, the age of the company, the valuation in 2014, and within 36 to 48 months, the, val the new valuation. These are not just the digital version of traditional businesses. Something else is happening. So the internet we know has dropped the cost of demand and exponential organizations use technology to reduce the cost of supply. It's kind of obvious when you think about it. So many good ideas are. So this is the formula for an exponential organization, an MTP plus an, SA, uh, an SCA LE plus ideas. Ideas, yeah. So I'll give you what that formula is in just a moment. So the first one, the MTP, is a massive transformative purpose. It's the higher aspirational purpose of the organization, capturing our hearts and minds. So what these authors have done is I think they've really cherry-picked some of the very best bits of research but they've integrated it very well with this phenomenon of using technology in your business. So they, they then have these two notions of ideas and scale, and it's an acronym, and I'll just run through it very quickly. They say you need interfaces. You need technology interfaces. Do you have dashboards? Do you experiment? It needs autonomy, very similar to Daniel Pink's book on, uh, called Drive, and it's social, right? It's social. It's people-driven. So that's... The acronym for ideas, this massive transformative purpose supported by the idea of ideas, and then scale, scale. Staff on demand is an interesting idea. Could you use people as you need them? It uses the community and the crowd. Now, this is a scary thing for a 1955 business because everybody outside the business 
1955 is an idiot. They don't understand what we do. So why would we talk to them? These guys are saying, hang on, aren't they the people buying from you? They use algorithms and they use leveraged assets. So I'll talk a little bit about that. It's mainly about renting. And of course, it's all about engagement, connecting with people. So you can see that you've got this juxtaposition of this idea of a massive transformative purpose, take over the world in a human way. The big shift is from this, this mindset of securing assets, right? I've got to buy stuff. And then I've got to protect that stuff. And then I've got to create boundaries. I've got to build walls. Donald Trump. I've got to build walls. That's how you go into the future in the Trump world. And then what I do is I sell access to this scarce resource that I have. Right? Sounds familiar. These guys are saying, well, tap into the external abundance. So there's that book of abundance by uh, Diamandis. Tap into that external abundance. There's a lot more going on on the outside than there is on the inside. So they're trying to really shift the problem space from ownership, which is about scarcity, it's really live in, uh, linear cost driven, to really openness. They have this idea that we've scaled technology, let, now they've scaled the organization. It's all about openness. You want to rent rather than own. You want to share rather than protect. I wish I read the book just before I bought my boat. This idea of staff on demand is a really interesting idea, and here's just an example of GigWalk. Does anyone use GigWalk? So this is the idea that you have lots of people walking around every day anyway, right? If you've ever pretended to be ill and gone to the waterfront for a day, you will know this, right? There are always people, and I don't, don't they work? They're always walking around, and GigWalk is a technology for those people. It says they're going to walk around anyway. Just give them a bit of technology, let them send you some information. An example of experimentation is, is this notion that's starting to grow quite strongly of uh, the, the failure award. Why would they do that? Well, they're, they're trying to encourage some sort of spirit of experimentation because the growth has flattened, right? The question is, are you creating opportunities where people can experiment a little bit and where they can do it safely and, of course, where they will learn something from that experiment? It's not just about wasting your money. Um, so they say it's, you know, it's about these kind of things. You can use the crowd to be creative. The crowd is much more likely to be creative than you. You can use the crowd for innovation. You've all, you're familiar with the idea of open innovation. That's not new, I think. You can use the crowd for validation. Does this work? And of course, you can use the, cr the, the crowd for funding. Everybody knows about that now. They're saying, don't start with an idea. And it's interesting, we're finding a similar thing. They, they, we really don't have a shortage of ideas. That's not the problem. The problem they're saying is not the idea. Start with a problem. Um, uh, the, the idea is not the problem. The problem is the problem, is really what they're saying. Gamification, obviously. Let's have some fun, but of course it's more about, it's more about engaging people. And then, of course, incentive prizes for customers, letting people outside the business win prizes for ideas. It, it take, gets you away from this idea that a small group of elite top management people sit in a room and come up with the answer. A kind of key insight here is this uh, functionality to price ratio. And what they're saying is that in the past, what used to happen is if you want high functionality, you had to really pay enormous amounts for it. What's happening now with technology is you could have huge functionality and the price has come down dramatically. They then talk about this idea of the deception of linear versus exponential growth. And the deception is, if this is the linear path, right up to that point, the linear version seems better. Does that make sense? So this is really the insight, the time of usage over the time of ownership. So this is, it's an interesting argument against that property you own in the south of France, because how often are you going to go there? And if it's really about the experience that you're getting from it, then maybe you just rent it for a while. Okay, so the, the, the evolutionary path that they then illustrate is this idea that you digitize, that disrupts it, it demonetizes it then. In other words, it becomes really, really cheap and it becomes democratized. Exponential organizations emphasize these things, autonomy, social technologies, I've spoken about the massive transformative purpose, experimentation, algorithms, I think you've, you, you get the idea, I won't bore you by reading it. So, 
while the opportunities are external, of course, many of the threats are also external. So I, I like the idea that they have this balanced argument. So there are some of their practical advice is ex inspire exponential organizations at the edges. So if you are a large corporate, and some large corporates even in South Africa have already started doing this, build a skunk works. Build, build a play pen on the edge of your business. What well, you can give people the opportunity to move between the edge and the center, if you like. But build something on the edge is what they're saying. And they're encouraging you to spin it out. Make it a different company. Call it something else. What difference does it make? Invest in partners with adjacent exponential organizations. Where that's a really scary thing. So, so the idea of the outside is taken to the next level where they start talking about, well, what's happening with your competitors on the edge? Maybe there's a connection there. It's very systemic, actually. Leverage or expose data. Hire a black ops team. I like this idea. So they like the idea of a black ops team. You know, it's sort of the Google X equivalent, and it's a kind of a stealth team, you know, a kind of a crack squad. So let's talk about some criticism of the book. Um, they have this argument that this 20th century business was an externalization machine. In other words, and it's still very much the case, right? One of the ways in which we define businesses is that they are externalization machines. If you're in the car building industry, you externalize the costs of your product, right? So you don't pay, for example, for the air pollution. You don't pay for that. Someone else pays for that. You've externalized that cost and you've internalized the revenue, right? Many businesses work like that. If you're uh, in mining, that's changing with acid mine drainage and so on. They're trying to get the company to pay for the systemic fallout of what they're going to produce. But in this case, are you not externalizing the risk of ownership to the customers? If you're going to use their property, their, what they own, if you're leveraging what they own, are you not then externalizing the risk to them? Is it not similar? I'm being hypercritical here, by the way. So they have this notion that the future is not what it used to be, but they have the same argument that things are growing exponentially. Now, if you have a formula for the exponential growth, then you anticipate that in the future it's going to grow at the same exponential rate. And we know that that's not true either, because since the discovery of the internal combustion engine, it hasn't become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think there's a built-in fallacy there. They have this notion, which all, um, well, a large proportion of these kind of speakers, authors have, that you're not ready. It's coming. You've got to buy our book and attend our university. But they're also saying, we're already doing it. So some people are ready. Why can't the rest of us just become ready when we're ready? So they have this similar idea that we're in trouble, right? It's a crisis. Yeah, you'll hear politicians say that a lot. It's a crisis. You'll also hear them say, it's not a crisis. <laughs> it's usually something in the middle. We have our own leniency on that, con on that continuum. Um, but they're also saying we're, we are solving problems more easily now. So if that's true, then where's the problem? And what really worries me um, is this notion that, you know, are we really just becoming algorithms? And with this bigger focus outside, will Big Brother simply become ever bigger? What's really cool is you can go online and you can test whether you are an exponential organization. <laughs> so what I did is I took the Institute for Futures Research, I did the test, I lied through my teeth, and congratulations, your organization is an exponential organization. But it's, I'm, I'm sort of being a little bit facetious, but it's, it's quite, a, a, quite a useful instrument, and it's free. It's free. And perhaps the thought I leave you with is that if it is free, to quote a, a documentary from 1973 called Television Delivers People, if it is free, then perhaps you are the product. Ladies and gentlemen, you've certainly been more than a product to me. Thank you very much. Sir. It's been great. <laughs>